Over to you, Jasmine. Great. Um, great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. I'm really excited to introduce Jen Heemstra, who will tell us about her living histories. On to you, Jen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's fun to get to share a little bit of my story. Um, and so I'll start right here, which is that I became a scientist, not in the way that uh, many people become scientists, which is that I was told that I was, in fact, really bad at science. Um, and this happened when I was heading into ninth grade. I had to wait in a line to find out if I was going to be approved to take kind of the science intensive track at my high school. And I expected I would because I liked math, I liked science. And I got to the front of the line and my guidance counselor said, you have not been approved because your eighth grade science teacher said that you are um, not skilled at science. Um, and that was a huge blow to me, but I thought, well, then let's find something else to do. So I took a uh, keyboarding typing class. They called it keyboarding back then, which uh, now in my job with how much typing I do was surprisingly useful. Um, but at the same time, I needed something to do after school. You know, I, I didn't really want to go home after school. And so my friends convinced me to join this thing called Science Olympiad. Um, and when they first started to talk to me about it, I said, no, 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 I'm like not good at science, right? Like I'm not allowed to be in biology with all of you. I'm the, the one who's bad at science. But they said, no, the coach is great. You should just show up. And so I walked into the classroom, the coach, Dr. Marcia Sprang, phenomenal, phenomenal educator, changed the course of my life. She looked at me and said, hey, welcome to Science Olympiad. And I said, I'm bad at science. Uh, I'm not in biology. She said, that's okay. We have a geology subject and nobody takes geology. So you will be on an even playing field with everyone else. Here, study these rocks. And what I realized is that as I dove into it, I just loved it. I sat there staring at these rocks every day for like hours. Um, and it really made me love science. And the thing I learned from that is that is this lesson about motivation, that there's kind of intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. The psychologists all study this and could tell us all about this. Um, but basically what I was living in was intrinsic motivation. I was doing something that nobody was expecting me to be good at, and I was just doing it for fun. And that actually made me better at it. And so that's a lesson that I now take into my everyday life, that even when I have to do things that are extrinsically motivated, like right now I have progress reports do for my grants, I can always find ways to make them fun, to make them things that I personally enjoy. And so Science Olympiad convinced me to go to college and major in science. I went through my first year, unlike Howard, um, I did not enjoy my general chemistry experience. Nothing about it made me want to be a chemist. Um, I also wasn't enjoying the major that I was in at the time. And so I found myself a little bit into college realizing that I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And since I had not enjoyed general chemistry, um, I did not anticipate that organic chemistry would be any better. So I thought, well, I'll just take this over the summer. I will get it over with. Um, and I was terrified of this class, right? Like many students, but I just worked really, really, really hard. And what I realized is that, you know, I kept thinking, oh, well, maybe the difficult part will come in, in time, right? I'm working so hard. And then halfway through, I was like, oh, wait, maybe, maybe this is the difficult part. And maybe because I'm working hard at this, I, I'm actually doing OK in it. And so that convinced me to go and join a lab. Um, I had, was so fortunate to have a mentor who was willing to give me a shot as an undergrad researcher. Uh, James Nowick is sitting front and center in this photo. And I realized I love building. And I love building with molecules. And it was that experience that just lit a fire in me for this field of supermolecular chemistry, which is basically building with Lego bricks, but where those Lego bricks are molecules. And so it's helped me see what I wanted to do with my life, which then they convinced me I should go to grad school. I didn't really have any idea what grad school was all about, but they said, yes, you should do this. It's all research all the time. And I was like, sign me up. So um, I went to, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot the lesson I learned from this. Um, so the lesson I learned from this, I think it's actually a really, really important one these days, which is something about passion, that there's so much talk now about like finding your passion. And it's really great to love what you do. Um, but I love this quote from Angela Duckworth, because it really gets at the heart of kind of where I think society gets this messaging wrong, right? There's things we love that really, really drive us. Um, 
But there's also this message that like, if you don't find this thing instantly, that it's like, you know, love at first sight, then somehow you've missed out. And that is not at all true. That really your passion as Adam Grant says, passion, passion is a consequence of effort, not just a cause. And so if you're wondering like, what am I passionate about? What am I gonna do in my career? It isn't something that's just like going to magically be amazing when you first start doing it. It's usually something you find you kind of enjoy and then you work really hard at it and then you realize you enjoy it more and then you work harder at it and that passion develops with time. All right. So I went to grad school, um, went to University of Illinois, which is uh, very close to where I am now. I was actually just visiting there this morning and that was an amazing experience. It was like research all the time. Um, until my life kind of fell apart. In my last year of grad school, I lost my dad. And then when I flew home for his funeral, I found out that my best friend had cancer. And so it was a really, really tough year. Um, and then things got worse in that our family had kind of expected that once I graduated, my, my family, my spouse's family was like, okay, now it's time to start a family and stay home and have kids. And I, I never had really wanted exactly that path. I wanted kids, but I also wanted a career. Um, but then something happened and we couldn't really necessarily have kids at that time. And that was just such a, a really, really trying time in my life. All of these things that I had worked so hard for, it felt like, you know, what am I doing now? What should I be doing with my life? Um, but the, the thing that really got me through is that I had a fantastic mentor. This is my PhD advisor, Jeff Moore. And he just stood by me through all of that, gave me great advice, supported me, encouraged me. And it really taught me that great mentors are everything and great mentors are mentors for life. And if you're out there in academia, if someone doesn't care about you as a person, then they don't deserve your effort. They don't deserve to have you working in, in their group. And so I was so fortunate that I had this great mentor. Um, and so Jeff convinced me to at least try for a postdoc then of like, hey, maybe you can have this academic dream. Uh, the interesting thing that happened is that uh, a week after moving to Boston for a postdoc, we found out that uh, against kind of what felt like all odds, we're actually going to have a baby. Um, so this little guy is now about to get his learner's permit and start driving a car. So that's terrifying, but uh, but really, really fun. Um, but then that just created even more self-doubt about this academic path. Um, and again, I was so fortunate to have wonderful mentors who just came around me and listened to my doubts, listened to my insecurities, my imposter syndrome, and said, you know, if this is what you want, like we'll support you no matter what you do, but if this is what you want, you should go for it. And what this taught me is that I would much rather live with failure from having tried something and have it not work out than live with the regret of having this dream career that I never pursued. Um, and sometimes different is better. This meant I came together my proposals for my job applications like really late in the game. And so I ended up in my first faculty position saying, I've got this job in a lab. Now, what do I actually want to do, right? I wrote these proposals at the last minute to get a job, but they're not what I want to do. Um, but the answer to that was maybe one of the most important ones of my career, which is to recruit great people and give them tons of autonomy. And since day one, the people in our lab have been the ones driving the ideas. And I think that that has led to better science and actually more research funding. Um, and so I'm going to skip over this last slide because I know I'm about out of time. But um, what I wanted to share is just two lessons I've learned uh, throughout my career, which is, you know, our success is defined by like when everything's going right, right? The, the things you see on your CV are all the days your paper got accepted, your grant got funded, you got the award or the fellowship. But really, largely, our success is determined by what we do in the moments when everything's going wrong. And then speaking to the title of my presentation, you know, scientists, we run experiments all day, right? And we do this because there's always something interesting to learn. And something I've come to appreciate is that, in fact, our whole life, your life is just one big experiment. We're walking, talking, breathing psychology experiments. And it is the most interesting experiment that you will ever get to run. Um, the other takeaway is that while most people's career paths, you know, you hear about their career path. You think it looks like this, really it's a lot more like this, right? No career path is straight and that's okay. 
and that I work with absolutely amazing folks. So I have to thank the people in my group who allow me to be a faculty member. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story with you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I have a question for you from the chat. Um, would you share with us what advice and insight helped you get through uh, the challenging year in, in grad school where you had multiple challenging events that happened all at once? Oh, well, I will say one thing that helped me get through that was seeing a therapist. Um, I went and I didn't necessarily choose into that. You know, I've had people who have you know, taking care of me in my life. I went to go see my doctor to like get my asthma medication refilled. And he asked me how I was doing. And I think I just started sobbing and started telling him. And he was like, okay, here's your prescription, but like you're staying right here and you're not leaving this building until, you, you know, we're going to get you in to see a counselor this afternoon. And that person helped me to see I was putting too much pressure on myself. I was expecting myself to be coping with all of these horrible things in my life and still be just as productive in the lab as I had been before. And as I talked through them, something that was really helpful, they were like, you know, as you talk, your PhD advisor sounds like a really reasonable person. Do you think he expects you to be doing all of this? I was like, no, when you put it that way. And so it really, I was putting unreasonable expectations on myself. And also, I, I just had to give myself space to more. And I mean, losing, you know, I, I we kind of saw it coming with my dad, my best friend, not so much. You know, we had about six months with her from her diagnosis until she was gone. And so it was just really uh, took a lot of crying and a lot of family and support. But it also taught me about what's important in life. And it's it's not the papers or the grants. We need those things to get by, but there's some things that are a lot more important. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, just one more follow-up from from the the chat. How how do you balance the pursuit of the intrinsic values with the need for external validation, which is kind of ubiquitous in academia? Oh, that is such a good question. Here, let me see if I can go back to that slide. I think this is really what this taught me is that. It isn't that I can just live in a world where every day all I need to do is is grow and learn. That would be amazing, right? You know, we need to publish papers. We need to get grants. You know, I needed to get tenure. I needed to get promoted. We need to do all of those things. The people in my lab now especially need that. You know, I don't need those things as much now anymore, but they really, really do. It's so important to their careers. And I think the important thing isn't we we can't just say, oh yeah, those those things aren't important. External rewards don't matter. They definitely matter. But the thing I've learned is that if we can motivate ourselves from the intrinsic side, it actually makes us more likely to get those extrinsic achievements and to do it in a way that we don't burn out. Like if all of my self-worth is tied up in whether my manuscript gets accepted or not, then I'm going to get really, really burned out and, and not be resilient. Um, whereas if I can see it as, okay, this is, I want to do this research because I'm going to learn something. Yes, I need to publish it. Um, when it gets kicked back by the reviewers, it's like, all right, challenge accepted. Let's see if we can, you know, fix these things and, and get this back in. Um, so the more we can drive from our intrinsic motivations, it allows us to do better on the things that we need to do and to stay a lot healthier as we do that too. It, it allows us to feel a lot more in control of the situation. And really I say great. all that okay. as I am not a psychologist. So that is my <laughs> armchair uh, pop science psychology of doing experiments on myself with that. So if you're interested in that, definitely go read up from the experts. Fantastic advice. 